Andrew Huberman has been blowing up lately for reasons other than his science communication and this article in this New York magazine has been going viral and funnily enough it mentions me but I've nothing to do with it. But besides this recent fiasco people love Huberman and I get it. He provides a lot of helpful information to millions of people. But Huberman is a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology which of course has to do with the brain and eyes so I can understand when people question his advice outside of these areas. If your foot doctor was telling you what supplements you need to take in order to heal your your IBS or chronic shoulder pain, you'd probably at least consider getting a second opinion. So is the Hoopman sleep stack worth buying and based on actual human evidence or is it just another way for these supplement companies to line their pockets? Now I'm not going to give you my personal experience as I've not tried the stack in its entirety but what I am going to do is go through the ingredients and explain their dosages and what beneficial outcomes they've had in humans if any. So first off what is the stack? Well the Huberman sleep cocktail consists of four individual supplements and it's available for purchase on the Huberman shop front of my Mentis for around $168, which will give you approximately a two month supply. It contains magnesium trionate, apigenin, myonositol, and L theanine, all of which are to be taken about 30 to 60 minutes before you go to sleep. First of all, Momentus, although I've never used or tried their products, are National Science Foundation certified. In other words, they've had a third party continuously test their products to make sure that they're safe and they contain the level of ingredients that they say they do. And that's important because in this narrative review released last year by Jagam and colleagues, they estimated that anywhere between 14 and 50% of supplements tested contained anabolic agents or other prohibited substances. That's really concerning if A, you're an athlete who gets drug tested or B, you're somebody who wants to know what's actually in their products for safety reasons. So first of all, Huberman suggests that we take magnesium trionate or bisglycinate before you go to sleep to create a mild form of drowsiness. Now magnesium is technically an earth metal and is essential in the body as a cofactor or in other words, a starting ignition for hundreds of metabolic processes. Like supplementing with most nutrients, magnesium has its greatest effects when someone who's deficient in it takes it which isn't all that common in the western world since a lot of the food that we eat contain magnesium. When it comes to sleep there's tons of anecdotal evidence of people taking magnesium before they sleep but in terms of the actual scientific literature it is still very early days. According to this systematic review of the effects of magnesium on sleep diets that are higher in magnesium tend to be associated with higher quality of sleep. However to date there's only been five randomized controlled trials with respect to magnesium supplementation and its effects on sleep in healthy people. The results have been fairly mixed but with with that said, the most well-designed paper found that when older subjects were given 500 milligrams of magnesium per day for eight weeks, they saw increased sleep time, sleep efficiency, and the concentration of serum renin and melatonin. Interestingly, renin is a hormone that helps regulate blood pressure and is one of the main reasons why I myself take magnesium twice a day. It is worth noting though that none of these five studies use magnesium trinate or bisglycinate. In fact, the study that I mentioned used magnesium oxide, which is often considered the worst kind of magnesium. You'll typically hear a naming convention of magnesium magnesium plus other elements such as magnesium citrate, magnesium hydroxide, magnesium trinate, you get the drift. Essentially magnesium isn't stable by itself and needs to be attached to something else. This mixture if you will is called a compound and different magnesium compounds tend to be used in different situations. Now magnesium trinate is recommended by Huberman because he states that it effectively crosses the blood brain barrier faster compared to other magnesiums and the mechanisms of how magnesium improves sleep is believed to be due to its effects on certain neurotransmitters such as NMDA or GABA. With that said, there is very little research on magnesium trinate in humans and none on its effects on sleep. There does seem to be some rodent data to say that it is delivered to the brain more effectively than other forms, but it's not ideal to be making practical recommendations for people based on rat studies. Another issue with this form of magnesium is that its elemental value is really low. So for example, the trinate part of magnesium trinate makes up 90% of the ingredient and the other 10% is made up by magnesium. The study that I cited which showed positive effects on sleep, they used five 500 milligrams of elemental magnesium and if you were to match that dose using the trionate from the Huberman stack on the Momentus website your two month supply would now shrink down to a 20 day supply. Now I'm absolutely not suggesting that you do this given there's literally no research on magnesium trionate in sleep but Huberman's fallback option magnesium bisglycinate seems to be like a better option because it has more human evidence. For what it's worth this is the type of magnesium that I personally consume on a daily basis getting around two to three hundred milligrams of elemental magnesium and I take it mainly for its blood pressure lowering effects. It's hard to state the dosages for sleep with any confidence since there's so little data available but the studies that do show any kind of benefit range from 64 to 500 milligrams of elemental magnesium. The second supplement on the list is one that most people have probably never heard of and that's apigenin. It's a plant properly found most abundantly in chamomile tea. According to Huberman it's supposed to give you anxiety reducing properties and help you fall asleep that way. Now this one I am very skeptical of. I am partial to a cup of chamomile tea in the evening now and then which is about 1% 
happy gen and by weight, but there is a distinct lack of trials in humans. And in fact, as far as I'm aware, there has only been two studies in humans to date using happy gen and supplementation, one in Alzheimer's patients and the other in patients with insomnia. In that study, it showed moderate subjective sleep improvement. The lack of research is largely due to apigenin's major instability and very low bioavailability, basically meaning it's broken down before you can get any benefits. Some research does suggest that bioavailability could be improved by packaging it in various delivery systems, such as contained in emulsions or liposomes. But these aren't things that you can make at home. Let's say you have a colander and you're washing off some rice before you cook it, but the colander has huge holes. So when you're washing it, most of the rice falls through and goes down the sink and is washed away. That's pretty much what's happening here. I've even tried to understand the dosages because if you look at the comments on Huberman's videos, everyone's asking this, like what is the dosage for apigenin? And he doesn't give one. And it's my guess that he doesn't give it because there are no dosages. It's pretty much pulled out of thin air. Supplement companies do typically put 50 milligrams of apigenin in their products. And the only logic that I can come up with here is that research suggests that it's a theoretical maximum daily intake. And then one company will just copy another. My own Ostol is the third supplement in Huberman's stack. And he recommends a dose of approximately 900 milligrams a day for those who struggle to stay asleep. My Ostol can simply be described as a sugar that's already in the body, including the brain. But I do really struggle to understand here where Huberman gets these facts and figures. My Ostol does seem to have some promise when it comes to things like blood sugar control, particularly with those who have obesity. But again, with sleep, we just have this massive distinct lack of evidence to warrant any practical application. And that's what this channel is all about. There's one paper in pregnant women, unlikely to be men, but these days you never know. But anyway, taking 2000 milligrams of myonositol did improve their overall sleep quality and quantity, but nothing in this research indicated that it specifically helped them fall asleep faster when they woke up during the night. Now, I don't want to sound like an overly negative prick, but it's not a good idea to base practical advice off of one study, particularly if those subjects had a human growing inside of them. Back when I was a teen and I just got into lifting, this one study came out showing that the aspartic acid increased men's testosterone by 42%. Amazing. Supplement companies were all over it. I even bought some because, you know, a 17 year old really needs to increase their testosterone. But then lo and behold, a few years later, more research comes out looking at the exact same question. And what I found that the aspartic acid actually had either no effect on testosterone levels or actually decreased it. And these days you'll never see the aspartic acid being sold in supplement stores. So long story short, we just need more research. Now, L-theanine is actually a pretty solid supplement. I've talked about this in the video that I made on Newtonic, the world's first productivity drink. And the human evidence shows that 200 milligrams grams of L-theanine can improve sleep quality in healthy populations. As it sounds, L-theanine is found in certain types of tea, including black tea and green tea, but consuming it in this way wouldn't be ideal before bed because these also contain caffeine. It works to improve sleep through anxiolysis, basically meaning it makes you more relaxed. And I personally use this supplement on and off for a very long time. So we seem to have a mix here in the stack of supplements that seem to be pretty efficacious, some that I've actually used myself, and then others that seem to be based on little or no research at all. I obviously can't say why Huberman does recommend them, but he does seem to value mechanisms quite a lot, as in this thing affects this thing in the body and therefore should improve sleep quality. And I really began to notice this when Huberman recommended cold exposure for improving fat loss or how cooling the palms of your hands was not only comparable, but superior for exercise performance than taking anabolic steroids. I can't help but think these logical leaps and promotion of poorly designed research makes its way onto his podcast because it just sounds novel or interesting or something that people just haven't heard of before. But I can only make guesses and most of the information that he shares probably isn't sensationalized and is genuinely helpful for most people. The harsh reality that you need to hear is that if you have poor sleep, no amount of apigenin or magnesium are going to counteract the fact that you're only in bed for six hours or that you have a constant IV drip of coffee hooked up to your veins. With that said, there are some supplements for sleep that have more evidence than the ones in this stack. And without making this video extremely long, you can check them out using the most up-to-date human evidence and dosages on examine.com. On examine, you'll find all the human evidence as well as the dosages. And this video is not sponsored by Examine, but it's something that I use almost daily and have done so for many years. I do have an affiliate link for Examine, as does every other member of Examine. And if you use that affiliate link, which is in the description, you can get a seven day free trial. And if you don't find it useful or you don't want to keep, you know, being a member, you can just cancel it. So overall, some supplements can be useful in certain situations for sleep and not the first thing that I would recommend. As a coach, a performance nutritionist, as someone that has read all the research on the specific supplements in the Huberman Sleep Cocktail, I can say that it's not something I personally would recommend and the supplements within the stack are not necessarily based on strong or human evidence. Let me know what your thoughts are. If you have any questions or feedback, please do leave it down in the comments.